today is the Septuagesima Sunday. We'll be back here again in Denver. And the Septuagesima Sunday is used to be considered the first day of the liturgical year. Now we consider the first Sunday of Advent the first day, but in olden times this was the first day for the first thousand years or so of our church, or the new year for Catholics before. And the epistle for the Septuagesima Sunday is taken from St. Paul's first letter of the Corinthians, chapter 9, and also 10. Brethren, know you not that they that run in the race all run indeed, but one receiveth the prize. So run that you may obtain. And every one that striveth for the mastery refraineth himself from all things, and they indeed that they may receive a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible one. I therefore so run, not as at an, an, an uncertainty. I so fight, not as beating the air, but I chastise my body and bring it into subjection, lest perhaps when I have preached to others, I myself should become a castaway. For I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all in Moses were baptized in the cloud and in the sea, and all did eat the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, and they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased. And then the Gospel, taking that according to St. Matthew, chapter 20. At that time, Jesus spoke to his disciples this parable. The kingdom of heaven is likened to a householder who went not out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And having agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he, he, sent them, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing in, in, the, in the marketplace, idle. And he said to them, Go you also into my vineyard, and I will give you what shall be just. And they went their way. And again he went out about the sixth and about the, ni the ninth hour, and did in like manner. But about the eleventh hour he went out, and found them standing. And he saith to them, Why stand you here all the day idle? They say to him, Because no man hath hired us. He saith to them, Go you also into my vineyard. And when evening was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith to his uh, steward, to his, to his servants, to his steward, Call this laborers, and pay them their hire. Beginning from the last, even to the first. When therefore they were come, that came about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. When the first also came, they thought that they should receive more, and they, they also received every man a penny. And re receiving it, they murmured against the master of the house, saying, These last have, have worked but one hour, and thou hast made them equal to the to us, who thou that have borne the burden of the days and the uh, and the heats. But he answering said to one of them, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst thou not agree with me for a penny? Take what is thine and go thy way. I will also give to, to this last even as to thee. Or is it not lawful for me to do as I will? Is thy eye evil, because I am good? So shall the last be first, and the first last. For many are called, but few are chosen. Thus are the words of today's Holy Gospel. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. In modern times, we consider the liturgical year to begin on the first Sunday of Advent. Looking at history as simply in an historical type of way that God was there in the, that preparing for the judgment, the final judgment, preparing for the coming of Christ in his first coming, preparing for the coming of Christ in his second coming. But in olden times, in the early first millennia of the church, the day was the greatest day. Today was the first day. 
And today we realize the spirit of the church and the spirit of the world in which we are born. We are born in war. We are born with enemies all around us. And as we've mentioned many times, the beginning of the gospel, the beginning of the mass today, this is called the Sunday of the Chicum de Deron May. We, we name the Sundays by the intro to the mass. Remember that in the famous story of the, the uh, hunchback of Notre Dame, he was found on the Sunday after Easter, and being on that Sunday, they would named him after the intro to the Sunday, which begins with Quasimodo. Quasimodo. So he called him Quasimodo because he was found on Quasimodo Sunday. Today is Chicum de Dero May, Jamie Tus Martis Sunday. Chicum de Dero May, Jamie Tus Martis. The tears of death have surrounded me. The church is very realistic. We are born in tears of death. Why do we say the tears of death have surrounded me? Because my great great grandfather, the father of all of us, he was not meant to die. His name is Adam. He was, knew nothing of the tears of death until he decided to eat a forbidden fruit, until he decided to commit the sin of pride, until he decided to turn against God, and then he shaped human history so that all of his children would be born with, with a Jamie Tus Martis. They would be born with the tears of death. And the next words of the introit, and the sorrows of hell have encompassed me. So I am surrounded by the tears of death and the sorrows of hell. And when we recognize when we are born in such a world, what does this do to us? It creates a sense of urgency. It creates a sense of necessity. It creates a sense of seriousness. We are going onto a boat, but this boat is the Titanic after it hit an iceberg. We are going onto a boat that is sinking. It's not time to play the music. It's not time to go to the bar. It is time to do something about the sinking boat. And the sinking boat of humanity, there's where we are born, on a sinking boat. We are born with the tears of death around us and the sorrows of hell. What is the approach of a reasonable man? What is the approach of the church? How do we deal with this? Because the fact is, we recognize everywhere around us, no one who has ever lived has ever been younger than someone else that's died. They die in the womb before we're born. Those that are one day old are older than many millions of souls who never made it that far in this earth. And those that are a year old are older than many who have died before they turn that one year old. There is no one who doesn't know someone younger than him that died. We are surrounded by the Jamitus Mortis from the very moment of conception until the very end of life. That's the reality. We are surrounded by the Jamie Deuce Martis, the tears of death. And so what is it? What does a church do? What do we do in such a case? God once said 2,000 years after he created the world, 1,656 years after he created the world, he wiped it out with water, and he left only eight men alive. Noah and his three sons and their four wives. And that's it. And then he rebuilt humanity from these eight and then, then once again, he is going to bring the world to an end at the very end of the world, but there's still going to be death. So we have to face death and the sorrows of hell. There are two things we're surrounded by, death and the sorrows of hell. So therefore, what did God do? God, just, God looked down upon the earth, and what did he see? As St. Alphonsus, or rather St. Ignatius says in his meditation on the Incarnation that we read in the Ignatian Retreat, he says, what happens in heaven? We look at that day when the Blessed Virgin Mary was 15 years old and she was alone in prayer at peace in her house of Nazareth. She was alone in prayer at peace. And what happened? The angel, God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost looked out upon the earth and they saw that all men were dying and going down into hell. That's what they saw. All men, from the beginning of time until the end of time, are dying and going down into hell. So therefore, God decreed in his infinite mercy, in his infinite goodness, and in his supreme justice, that at the fullness of time, God the Son would take on human flesh 
And he would take on human flesh surrounded by the Jamie Tus Mortis. Surrounded by the sorrows of hell. He is surrounded by the sorrows of hell. He is surrounded by the tears of death. And Christ is born. And the angel Gabriel comes down to that girl. And he asks her to be the mother of God. And she accepts. And she says, fiat. Let it be done. You know, that's what a worker says. It's why it's chosen by the gospel today and the gospel today. That the laborer, a master, went out. Remember, this was considered the first day of the liturgical year in olden times. And therefore, the, the father said, what should be the first gospel? It's going to be the gospel of a, of a parable of a father who went out, or, or a householder that went out to hire laborers. Why did he go out to hire laborers? Because he looked out and he saw the enemy is attacking my country. The enemy is destroying my people. There is death all around us. I need to, what's the first thing I gotta do? I gotta go out and I gotta hire laborers to fight against them. I gotta hire laborers to fight against the famine that they are bringing and to plant seed. I've gotta hire laborers that are gonna carry swords and fight against the attacks of the enemy. You know why God would not allow himself to be born in the temple of Solomon? He would not allow himself to be born in that temple. Solomon built the temple during the time of peace. David was a man of war. And God said, David is after my own heart. Solomon built that beautiful temple. And there is a prophecy of Daniel that says, God will not appear in this temple. He will never come in the temple of Solomon. Because it was built in peace. It was built by a king of peace. And Solomon built that temple. And it was a beautiful temple built by the king of peace. And you remember at the end of the days of God of Solomon, God came to Solomon and said, you've turned away from me. Your heart is turned away from me. He would not come in that temple. Nebuchadnezzar would come in about 590. Five, five, 606, he brought the Jews into captivity. And then about 10 years later, he became angry. And he, was, and he destroyed the temple. He ripped it down to the ground. And the temple was destroyed. And then Daniel had a vision, so the temple will be rebuilt. And in that rebuilt temple, which shall, be, which shall be not so beautiful in the beginning, but when the Messiah comes, it will be most magnificent and more magnificent than the first temple. This will be the temple the Messiah comes in. But when it is built, it will be built by the great prophet Esdras. Then Esdras instructed the workers, you will have a trowel in one hand, and you will lay the stone." But the devil knew that this temple was more sacred than the first one, and therefore he sent soldiers to kill and destroy the temple. And hence Ezra described, you will, have a, you will continue to build, but you will have a trowel in one hand, you will have a sword in the other. And while you're building with one hand, you kill the enemy with the other. For this temple was built in battle. And this is the temple that the Christ walked in. He didn't walk in the temple built in peace. Our Lord Jesus Christ was not a man of peace. He did not like peace. Why little boys, real boys, when they are little boys and they grow up, by the time they each raise a reason, the first thing they want to do is fight. They grab a sword, they grab a gun, and they look for bad guys and they hack them to bits. Since they can't hack real bad guys to bits, they have them in their dream. I have my little war, my war. We're looking towards Good Friday. We're looking towards that day when Christ is going to, as a warrior, as a representative of the kingdom of heaven, as the king of that kingdom, and as a soldier of that kingdom, he is going to fight Satan, he is going to wipe him out. And St. Paul, of all the apostles, he's the greatest of the apostles. Why? Because he's the most warrior-like. He's the most one. He says, I fight as though I'm, I don't fight as I'm beating the air. I fight with a purpose. And here he reminds us, we know we're in a battle. We are in the army of Christ. We get the uniform. How do we get the uniform? We get baptized. We get the uniform when we're baptized. So we got the uniform. That's nice. Many a man wearing the uniform of Christ has been a traitor. Others have just simply laid in their trenches when it was time to charge and fell asleep. Others simply were cowards and didn't go to battle. Others went to battle, but they never pulled the trigger. Others swung the sword, but never at the enemy. 
And they did nothing to fight for Christ, but they wore the uniform. We wear a uniform when we have the Catholic faith. We wear the uniform when we're baptized. And then he gives us weapons. We have a sword. We have a spear. We have all the breastplate of justice and so on. We have the shield. We have all these wonderful weapons. They are the virtues. It is by virtue that we defeat Satan. Every young man that joins the army knows he's joining an army. He's joining something bigger than himself. He's joining an army. He's going to fight against an enemy. But how does he prepare? He has to go to boot camp. He has to exercise. He has to crawl on the ground. He has to jump over high walls. He has to learn how to use weapons. He has to develop his physical strength. He has to become fit. Why does he become fit? 100 years was a very subtle attack against Catholics. Taking Protestantism and applying it to the Catholic Church. Protestants believe it's my own individual salvation. It's me and it's Jesus, and that's it. And me and the devil, and that's it. They don't believe in an army. They don't believe in the necessity of belonging under captains, which are called priests, under generals that are called bishops, under the chief who is called the pope, fighting inside of an army that is using weapons such as sacraments and prayers approved by our Holy Mother the Church, plus also private prayers and penance in order to fight against Satan that we are part of an army. They don't like that. Now this error and heresy has entered into the Catholic Church in the last 400 years. And how did it happen? Catholics now believe all that matters is that I save my soul. I have to be spiritual so that I don't commit a sin against the flesh. I have to be spiritual so I don't commit a sin of pride. I have to be spiritual so that I don't commit a mortal sin. So I've got a list of 5,000 sins. 2,000 of them are venial. So those are okay. We'll commit those. Then 2,000 are mortal. How close can I get without making it mortal? So that's okay. But if you're really spiritual, you're going to not commit any of the 5,000 sins. If you're moderately spiritual, you're going to commit 2,430. It depends on how spiritual you are. So that you're going, all that matters is that I stay out of mortal sin. And if I commit a bunch of mortal sins, make sure you go to confession before you die. And then you're all set. Make sure you get an anointing before you die. And you're all set. Forget about what St. Alphonsus Liguria said when he said the confession of a sick man is sick. Don't worry about that. In other words, when you confess when you're sick, you're rarely sorry and hence rarely forgiven. And all you did was add another sacrilege before you went to hell. That's what St. Alphonsus says. So few are truly repentant. But... Why do we repent? Why do we fight against the devil? Why is it important to not be impure? Why is it important to not steal? Why is it important to not lie? Because if I lie, steal, and impure, I enter the army of Satan, and I fight, fight as a soldier alongside of many other soldiers in order to drag souls to hell. I am not alone if I decide to sin. And I am not alone if I decide to fight sin. I'm not alone if I sin, I'm not alone if I fight sin, because I am born into a war in which the Jamitus Martis is all around me, the tears of death are all around me, the sorrows of hell are all around me, and I belong to the army of Christ. It matters whether I say my holy rosary each day. Why? Because souls are at stake. The Holy Mother of the Church is at stake. The grace for, for the Pope to receive the grace to be able to consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary today instead of tomorrow is at stake. It matters what thoughts I have because it affects the whole church. And that is why St. Paul says, notice that it only applies to the friends of God, not the enemies. Christ says the same thing. The children of darkness are wiser than the children of light because they know what they're doing. They go after sin and they know what they're doing. But the children of light are fools. In St. Paul, he says, I don't fight as an uncertainty. I don't fight as beating the air. I therefore so run, not, at an uns not as at an uncertainty. I so fight, not as one beating the air. Because this is the problem of the last 300 years. Catholics are running, but at an uncertainty. They're trying to run away from impurity. 
What are they running to? They don't know. They're just trying to run away from impurity. They're trying to run away from pride. What are they running to? They're just trying to stay out of mortal sin. They don't want it. They're not realize that their run and their exercise and their fight is to make them <coughs> soldiers who will be able to say to the king, Fiat. I must have the strength because I'm going to be told, charge. There's 4,000 bad guys there. All of them got machine guns. And you got a Nerf baseball bat. Now charge and start killing some guys with your Nerf bat. Not very encouraging. Are you ready to charge? As one soldier said, I don't need a gun. Because when the battle gets hot, there'll be plenty of them laying on the ground. There'll be lots of them laying on the ground. You want a gun? Borrow one. There's a guy over there. So get over there and borrow it. If you said, will you borrow it? Well, then kill him. He won't need it anymore. And then use the gun to shoot the other guys. Are you ready to charge when the general says charge? Are you ready to hold your ground when the general says hold your ground? That's why we run. That's why we stay away from impurity. Why does the devil love impurity? Because it weakens the soul. It weakens the will. It darkens the mind. So that when the say, our Lord says, charge, we won't hear the word. And if we hear it, we won't obey. We will run as cowards. But when Satan says charge, we will charge with impunity. That's why the devil loves impurity. Why does he love pride? Pride destroys the soldier. Pride makes a soldier unable to be obedient to God. Every single one of the sins the devil loves in order to make soldiers of Satan. And every one of the sins we fight against is in order to be soldiers of Christ. Our Lord right now needs priests to go into the vineyards. He needs priests. He needs soldiers. He needs young men and women who are going to marry today with all its wicked laws. Marry today with all the wicked world. And still have all the children that God sends. And still live the holy Catholic life. And still love faith and Christ above all things. Even in this wicked world. And guess what? What does the scripture say? Many are the sorrows of the just. Many are the tribulations of the just. And the Lord hath saved them from every one. Every one. Remember we belong to an army. That's why we have to say our rosaries. That's where we have to pray. And then also here, as, Saint, as, as it is pointed out at the end of the gospel, into the epistle of St. Paul, remember, brethren, brethren, I will not have you ignorant. All the Jews were under the cloud. All of them ate the same spiritual food. All of them drank the same spiritual drink with Moses in the desert. But with most of them, God was not well pleased. And the rock that they drank from was Christ. And with most of them, God was not well pleased. We can say today, all Catholics eat the same spiritual food and drink the same spiritual drink. But with most of them, God is not well pleased. So most of them gone away. So now we got traditional Catholics. All traditional Catholics eat the same food and drink the same drink. They all go to the Latin Mass. But with most of them, God is not well pleased. So now they've gone out. So now we got the resistance. So now we got the resistance, and all the resistant Catholics all hate Bishop Filet and modernism and Vatican II, and they all eat the same spiritual food, and they all drink the same spiritual drink. And the drink came from the rock, and the rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased. Now what about these hours in the gospel? From the first hour to the last hour, he goes out to hire servants. In the eleventh hour, it's interesting because that's our time, the end of the world. In the eleventh hour, what does what happens? Christ goes to hire his servants, and it says, "Why did you? Why aren't you working?" Now, all the previous hours, just because they were lazy. Because remember, God goes to hire every single man, woman, and child on earth. There aren't. There's no like you're not good enough for this job. If you are breathing, and if you are human, and you are alive, you're hired. All right, now the fact is that God wants to hire every single human being. And they must all enter the Holy Roman Catholic Church. That's the vineyard. They must all fight. And they're all going to get their penny. They're going to get their denarius if they are faithful, which is eternal happiness with God in heaven. 
Everybody is being hired. And the majority say no. The majority hide when, the, when, the, when the, the, they come to hire them. But the 11th hour is different, and that's our time, the end of the world. At the 11th hour, it's a little different. They go out and say, why are you standing all the day idle? And they respond, because no man has hired us. What does this mean? Ignorance. We're in the age of ignorance. There are many, many souls that if they knew, they would have joined the vineyard. But they were sold so many lies. How, what, what, who believes, who's God? Well, Jesus Christ is God. Well, there's 500,000 religions that say he's God. All the Protestant ones, and you got the Catholic, and that's run by Pope Francis. And so the fact is, so what are you going to do? How do I know he's God? And so I, I, if I knew he was God, I would, I would follow him. Nobody hired me. And if I only knew the truth, I would be hired. Now these people are few, but they are all over the world. They are standing idle because no one has hired them. We have to go out to the ends of the earth and find those souls standing idle. Most are idle because they're lazy. Most are idle because they hate God. Most are idle because they refuse to work. But there are some standing idle who just don't know. Some of them got tattoos. Some of them are gang members. Some of them are, don't believe in God at all. Some believe in some kind of God, but they don't know. Some are Catholics. But they don't know what's going on because they've been told so many lies and they've been told so many errors and they don't know what to do. Most of those who don't know what to do are very happy to not know what to do. <laughs> but there are some who don't know what to do and would do something if they could. These are the ones that are standing all the day idle. And we go to those and we say, why are you standing all the day idle? Because no one is hired us. Go into the vineyard. And they went into the vineyard and they worked only one hour and they got the same pay. They got the same pay. One reason they got the same pay is because they were willing to work all day. They just didn't know. Another reason they got the same pay is because of the generosity of God. If I, is thy eye evil because I am good? So even if we work at the last hour, this is the time to join. You don't have to work for a short period of time and you get the same pay. This is the ideal time. So even if you're lazy, it's a good day to not be lazy anymore. This is the time. This is the sacred time. Also note this, says St. Augustine, when is God hiring? Always. He hired in the first hour, at the time of Adam. He hired in the next hour, at the time of Moses. He hired in the next hour, at the time of Christ, and he will hire until the end of the world. There's always a now hiring sign in the window of the Holy Mother Church. There's always a now hiring sign in the Holy Priesthood and the Holy Religious Life. There's always now hiring sign and entering to the holy battlefield of the Catholic Church. And remember, when you enter this battlefield, you enter as a soldier of the army of Christ. And if you sin, you become a member of the soldierhood of the army of Satan. And you're not fighting alone. We are not fighting only to save our own souls. If you save your soul, you will drag other souls in heaven with you. Or else, you're not going. And if you lose your own soul, you will drag other souls with you to hell. We are political creatures, we human beings. We are social creatures. We belong to a society, and there are only two societies. The Society of Christ and His Holy Mother and Holy Mother Church. And the Society of Satan. Which one do we wish to belong to? And let us not say because we join the Society of Christ and we're safe, we have to stay in that society. So let's persevere in the battle, maintain the faith, and remember that we must have a life of virtue and not only the truth. We must practice charity and not only believe the truth because this is necessary to actually carry weapons, to actually fight against the enemies of God and to truly defeat them. Lord, God bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.